Now here's the key. What you'll do, it's a big reservoir, right? 150 miles long, correct? You don't have enough time in your life to fish it all. Trust me, I've tried. Can't do it. I got three or four spots that I go to and they always have fish. Okay, so we got the casino flats here. This is the, the big point out here. And then you guys know where Fort Spokane Launch is at? Okay, you come out of Fort Spokane Launch and you come underneath the bridge, right? And then there's that swim area over here. Does that look familiar to everybody? Okay. All right, two places. Here's what happens. Because you got to go out there and you got to go to your spot and you got to stay to your spot. If you go out with me night while I fish in, my spot's 100 yards long and we sit there all night and we don't move. We just go back and forth on that shoreline. Because I know those fish are going to move in at some point in time. And if I leave, I'm not going to be there, right? I don't ever leave fish to find fish. What these shorelines have in common. Now, those of you that are familiar with this, this is a pretty steep drop right here, right? Your contour lines kind of look something like this, and then it comes out to this swim area, okay? And there's some stumps and there's some rocks and stuff in there, correct? All right? Well, what starts to happen, you've got, you've got chunks of rock and you've got stumps and stuff in here, and then when you start getting down to here, this rock gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what happens to this swim area? What is it? Sand. sand and gravel, right? If you don't have a graph or you don't have the ability to, uh, you don't have a good map that shows contours. Contours are visual with your eyes. If you see a big rock wall, what is that telling you? What's on underneath? Straight drop. As that changes to boulders, to chunk rock, to gravel, to sand, what's happening? It's starting to get gradual, correct? Because the sand is getting pushed up because it's lighter. So what that is, is that's telling you, if I look at this wall and it's a big chunk, or it's a, it's a huge boulder, or a cliff, and it's straight down, then it's going to chunk rock and gravel sand. Well, what those are is telling me one of my contours, and it's giving me an abrupt of where the transition in substrate occurs. Now a transition is any time it goes from, say, that bluff to big boulders, from boulders to smaller chunk rock, from chunk rock to gravel, from gravel to sand, sand to mud. Okay? You always want to fish on transitions. Transitions and substrate. So what you end up having here is you have an area which this, this is a percentage triangle area right here. Okay, this becomes the triangle right here. They're not going to go way up in the shallow water, right? They can inflate and deflate on this steep drop off. They can cruise up into here and feed. What also happens within this is that breaks down and you have transitions from gravel to sand or rock to sand, which is where they want to be. Guys, there's more big fish pulled out from here, guys fishing off the bank without a boat. You drive down there, you can even go down there right now because the fish are starting to move. You'll see guys fishing out underneath here with big bonfires and people assume that they're trout fishing. Well, they're not trout fishing. What they're doing is they're going from the boat ramp, walking this shoreline, throwing crankbaits, dirtbaits, swimbaits, whatever, down this shoreline, and they're catching big fish. But here's the problem. You pull into these, and I'll give you an example of this. It happened to some guys that I did a seminar for at the Sportsman's Warehouse. You pull into this thing. It's cold out. There's no light. Fishing at night is a mental game. You know, we've been down there when it's 8 degrees, right? My hands don't look that pretty because I'm not exposed to cold all the time. That's why those hands look like that, okay? It's a mental thing. You get down there, you make one or two passes, you're like, there's nothing here, it's cold, whatever. I told these, these two brothers, and they said, Seth, we want to catch a big walleye. We promise we'll let it go, blah, blah, blah. I did the seminar, I said, boys, just go here. You're going to launch your boat, you're going to tell your wife, if your wife goes, great. You're going to say, hey, I'm going to fish from 8.30 until midnight and I'm coming home. And it's like clockwork, 8.30, don't ask me why. That's the only fishing I do where it's like, I look at the moon phase, which we'll talk about, and I gotta be on the water at 8.30, because that's when it happens. So we get down there, and these guys get down there, and they go back and forth, they went back and forth four times. And I told them, if you doubt me, take a spotlight and shine it along that bank where this changes, right up against the bank and just see what happens. So they did. They went through there, 
They turned the light on. They went through this transition right here. And they went, whew, there were six big eyes out there. Three giant walleyes. So they flipped the light off, grabbed their jerk baits, tossed it out there, and they got 11 three quarter pounder. You know, he went out there this fall and shooed me, uh, sent me a picture on email of a 12 pounder they caught. What you have to do, guys, they are going to come into this. And I can think of several times where I've gone through seven times, nothing, and all of a sudden the next time through you got three over 10 pounds. It's because you're persistent and you stay there when you find those spots. And now I'm pointing you right to it. That is the spot right there. Okay? Another one where it occurs at, remember how we drew the casino flats was out here? Well, if you look at this point, what does this point do? It runs way out underwater, right? Well, what does this point have? Chunk rock, correct? Then it breaks down to sand because it's pushing back up towards this. And then your shoreline's transitioning. You have the same thing that happens out here on this point. Maybe you're starting out and you're trolling out deep here when it's 60 and up, and then you move in and you start casting this point. And this thing's a big spine, and it's shallow underneath it, guys. We hit that point this fall, because we were moving around just trying to find some different spots. So I said, let's go over and try the point, and I was with Chad and Brandon. And we had seven fish in about a half an hour between six and eight pounds. And the boys were casting this way, two of them, and I was th we, were, we were parked basically right on the middle of this. The boys were casting in like this, and I was casting out like this. And it didn't matter if you were casting that way or that way. The fish were there. But you just have to go there, and you have to be patient. You know, when you go pike fishing with me, I'll get on a weed bed, and we'll stay there all day. And you'll think I'm absolutely nuts, and then all of a sudden, it'll happen. And the reason being is that fish are active 10 to 20% of the day. Out of 24 hours, tell me when that is. You don't know. So you have to stay there because they're there. I can promise you they're there. You just have to stick it out. People give up on it too early. You know, everybody always emails and, you know, says you go out and catch all those big fish and da-da-da, and I tell them, look, I've been married and divorced three times, and that's because I fish too much. No, I, I have the same wife. But I go out and camp on those spots, and I stay there, and I pound away, and I pound away because I know they're there, all right? So those are the two spots that you're going to key in on. All right. Now, what it has to do with is moon phase. Let's talk about moon phase with you really quick so you understand. Now, I don't want you to say, you know, everybody says, Sus, when's a good time to go fishing? Any time's a good fishing. Let's go right now. Okay. But to increase your percentages, if you look at a moon calendar, you're going to see a waxing phase and a waning phase. All that means to you is waxing means building up to full. Waning means traveling away. Now the significance of a waxing moon, if you look out and it looks like this, okay, and the full moon is here, and there's three or four more days in between before it goes full. My best days are four to five days before the full moon, four to five days after. That's your best percentages. If that's when you can go, go. Now what you have to understand about this is this is going to affect your timing of when you catch the fish. Remember I said 8.30 to midnight? When you look out there and you see a, a waning, or excuse me, a waxing moon coming up, that waxing moon rises up in the sky earlier. So this fourth day before, it may have come up at, say, 8 o'clock. This fourth day after, it may come up at 9.30. And that affects it. When it starts to come up, that's when they're going to start biting. So because you went out here and you hit them really hard at 8.30 and the moon came up and it was four days before and it was waxing to it and you hit them really good between 8 and 9, don't go to, the, to this direction here and you go out and you fish from 8 to 10 and nothing happens. Don't get frustrated. Stay from 10 to midnight because everything's happened later. All right? Now, I have found, and this is not going to affect if you guys go out, but this is how sensitive the walleye's eyes are at night. I find that a full lit, bright, bright moon, even if it's four or five days before, if a little bit of cloud cover moves in across that or a little fog, as soon as that goes across, boom, they start biting like crazy. Because their eyes are so sensitive, that's actually bugging them, believe it or not. So cloud cover at night, don't worry about it. If, if you go out there and you don't see any moon, don't sweat it. If it's all clouded up, don't, I've caught them, it's raining, it's snowing, doesn't matter, okay? 
So now, what you have to do is understand how you're going to fish for them. And I've got a couple different bait profiles up here. And this is just general rules. It's not, guys, fishing, anybody that, that tells you fishing is an exact science is a liar. Because it's not. Every day is different. Everything's different. All you can do is take the generals and go through your progressions. Well, Seth said this. If this wasn't working and I told you this is more for doing this, pick it up and throw it anyway. Okay? Fishing is not an exact science and it never will be. I don't care what is said. All right? Here's a general rule. If you have some moonlight coming through the clouds or you've got the bright conditions, you want to use a subsurface jerkbait. Like this guy right here, you can use a husky jerk, whatever. I sell these in my store. This is a river to see. We use them. We like them. Whatever you want to get, okay? What this guy does is it only goes down about three or four feet. Now, how many of you believe that walleye are always on the bottom? Yeah, walleyes are always on the bottom, okay? I'm here to tell you, if you go down there at night and start, start spotlighting, you'll see a walleye out off your boat that's basically a foot underneath the water. It goes against everything in your mind that it should be, but it happens. So what happens with that bright conditions like that, the walleye is basically, if this is the walleye, he's camped down there four or five feet. And he's using that moon to silhouette anything that goes by. Okay, if it's a good moonlight out and you're out fishing, you can see the bats go by, right? You see them buzzing by if you're out bass fishing or whatever, or just out camping, you'll see the bats go by. You'll silhouette them. Well, that's what the walleye's doing. So you'll throw this out, jerk it down, and, and you don't have to be real gentle. You know, everybody thinks, well, I gotta fish them really slow, I gotta have these little tiny things. No, a walleye's a top of the line predator, trust me. He's got big teeth, he's got big eyes, and he can get it done. You use the shallow running baits when the moon is out because they're silhouetting, they're feeding up. They're using that light to their advantage. If you go out and you have cloudy conditions, low light conditions, it's raining, whatever it may be, what you want to do is cast this bait up to the shore, boom, hit. What it's going to do is this is a jerk shad body. I've caught more giant fish on that type of body than I have anything else. Okay, Jerk shad, that's shad profile. What you'll do with this is you'll throw it up, and guys, you're throwing right on the shore. I mean, you're going to break a couple baits because you can't see that well at night and hitting the bank. But you'll crank this guy down, and what it's doing is going bam, bam, bam. It's hitting the rocks. Now what you're doing is generating noise because they're going to feed down to that because they don't have that good light to silhouette. So you're, you've got the rattles going off plus the clacking of the bait running down there to draw their attention. What's going to happen is this thing's going to beat across, boom, boom, boom. It's going to pull out into open water. Once it quits hitting the bottom, stop it. Just pause it. And then start your retrieve again and pause it. 90% of the time they hit it when it starts coming off the bottom and out into open water because now it's vulnerable. It's out in open water, okay? Jerk shad. So low light conditions, a diver profile like this. And just to give you a real quick, guys, see how these baits are both thin? Okay, see how those are both thin? Thin profile baits are always easy for a fish to eat. It's most desirable to them because they can catch it and they can slide down easy. Okay, it goes down a lot easier than a big, like a pumpkin seed profile, okay? So thin is in. So you see big bass crankbaits? You know what I'm talking about? They're like this big around? Well, what's a bass mouth like? That's about that big around, okay? These ones for the walleye, thin profile, right? Most consistent, but as you're going to see with these baits, there's a rule break there, okay? Now, we think of walleye as these little dainty you know, three inch uh, curl tail grub with a piece of worm on there or whatever. You'll never ever see me on the show using worms or leeches or any of that. It's not that I, I won't do it. It's just that the fish that I catch on artificial stuff are far larger than the stuff that I catch on worms and leeches, okay? You can go catch a lot of fish on that, but you're not gonna catch the big fish. I have never caught a fish over eight pounds using a worm or a leech. It's always been on a hard bait, a big body jig, something like that. Now here's what's going to happen. Now you're saying thin profile and, and those these are obviously bigger, correct? And what do they look like? Rainbow trout, right? All right. These are two styles. This is a lipless swim bait right here, made by River to Sea. This is a lip swim bait, basically like a big crankbait. All right, it's got a paddle tail on the rear. 
what's going to happen out there, let me just give you this thing right here. What takes more effort for a fish to catch? I'm not saying to swallow, to catch. This bait or this bait? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. It's what you have to look at is what's the reward for the effort. Now this one takes more work to digest, to push down. But it's going to travel just as fast. It's going to hit this with just as much ferocity as it is this. It's a predator. That's how they're going to take it down. But the reward for this is much greater than this, correct? So what happens when you go through there, the first few times I go through on my spots, and we just started experimenting with these about three years ago, the big swim baits, because I thought, you know, they're eating the trout. I know they're eating the trout. The biologists know they're eating the trout. We started experimenting with these. And what we found is we wouldn't catch as many fish, but we catch big fish. Instead of catching maybe seven or eight good quality fish, now you're getting down three or four fish, but you're talking fish, you know, 10 plus pounds, okay? What happens with these is you just gotta go out and you just huck and huck and huck. It's a mental thing. They, they wanna eat it, but you're only gonna get them when they're active with this, all right? So usually what happens, we go through our spot four or five times, and I know when this spot should kick on. And if we go through there four or five times, and I don't hit them on a swim bait, then I immediately do a, do a downsize. Whether the light conditions, remember, it's going to affect the light. If it's good light, I'll go to this. Because this guy can fish it high or low. I can bounce the bottom with it or I can fish it up high, okay? So what I'll do is I'll downsize and make a pass through there with this, all right? But what you'll find when that water temperature is 55 degrees down to about 52 degrees, these swim baits will all you'll be throwing right here and you're gonna catch huge fish with it. And what happens is, you'll be out there at night, and if you're out there night fishing and you hear the trout slapping the surface, and you hear like big splashes, they're not trying to eat flies, okay? They're running from walleyes. And we heard that over and over again down there. You'd hear it, like, why is that trout coming clean out of the water? You know, when we first started doing it. Well, it's because these guys move in Trout like cooler water, right? The surface temperature is cooled down. They're now moving in. And one of their favorite forages, besides mice and shrimp in there, which they eat a lot of mice and shrimp in Roosevelt, the rainbows do, is snails, believe it or not. You'll catch those fish down there, the trout, and if you keep a couple of them that are on the bank, they're packed full of snails. It'll feel like they have gravel in their stomach. Well, they're up shallow getting those snails. So when those trout come in, that's the big food for the walleyes. They're not going after perch and sculpin and such. They were after them trout. So from 55 to 52 degrees, the big trout baits are what's going to work for you.